Our next speaker is Dr. David Herford, and he is, and you know what he is, you can read about it, but he's going to explain why teachers must understand how to teach students to read using the principles in the science of reading. This is my pet, pet project. So, Dr. Herford, thank you for showing up today. And you're going to go up or you want to go down? I'll just be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are we good? That sounds good. Um, thank you. Well, it's always interesting to speak after lunch because physiologically, you know, blood is diverted from the brain for just a little while. And I remember when I was in high school, I had American history, Civil War from uh, a teacher who loved that period and he had period pieces. Uh, he brought in actual muskets and stuff to class. And it, it was right after uh, lunchtime, so a lot of times people were getting a little drowsy, and he would show real footage of different things that uh, people experienced at that point in time. And uh, I remember like half the class fell asleep, and he picked up the trash can, those big old metal trash cans, and dropped it. Scared the devil out of all of us. Because you know, when you're in high school, your reflexes are super fast, so people are falling out of their chairs and all. But it was kind of interesting. So you guys did a really good job paying attention to what was going on here. And in reality, there's some overlap to what they were talking about in terms of some of the issues that uh, kind of prompted their interest in creating that type of system and what we're talking about with reading. So I think a lot of times people think reading, OK, that's something we learn in school. But the major problem is we really haven't been teaching reading properly. So right now in Kansas, if you look at the National Assessment of Educational Process and Reading, we're at 40% of kids who can't read at the basic level. And the basic level is a rudimentary ability to read. So if they're below basic, they're essentially not reading, which is terrible. And we, we need to do something about that. And what's interesting about our history is we've known for roughly 40 years the proper way to engage in reading the, that's based in the science. And, and the science piece of it is what we do in science is try to figure out what reality is. And there's specific things that we do scientifically to make sure our own personal biases don't creep into that. Because guess what? Even scientists have personal biases about how things should work. And so, Science is really just a systems of rules to help us understand what reality is. So we've known for 40, 50 years how to teach reading properly, but no one's been listening to us. And part of the problem is that researchers don't do a very good job of talking to teachers, the practitioners, and teachers don't have time to read the science. And you remember No Child Left Behind? Can I say that without people going, Ugh, right? <clears throat> No Child Left Behind was created because Reed Lyon, who was the main architect of um, No Child Left Behind, was sitting at Health and Human Development, and they were giving out millions of dollars in grants per year. And the results of those grants were saying, we can teach all kids how to read. And then Reed was like, then why the heck aren't we? And so he went to George Bush and said, we need to do something about this. And Reading First and some other initiatives came about and I know Reed Lyon. I speak to him ever so often, got an email message actually from him last week. He is still angry. We're still not teaching kids how to read. It's ridiculous. So I wanted to give you kind of the nuts and bolts about how this stuff works. What, what is going on with the science of reading? What is the science of reading? How does reading work? Because I think most of you guys who are good readers are like, I, I don't even remember how I learned how to read. And you may have, if you're like me, I learned to read with those Dick and Jane books, right? See Dick run, 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 run. <laughs> See Jane run, 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 run. And we're supposed to divine how to read from that. And probably 40, 50% of kids, no matter how you teach them how to read, even if you teach them with techniques that really aren't very effective, they're gonna figure it out. I have, see this tie that I'm wearing today? I have uh, my wife's, cousin's grandson, uh, he was on Facebook and he was like two and a half and he was reading. And I'm like, a reading scientist, I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. You know, it's like, okay, Johnny, 
when I turn on the camera, say, look at the dog run. Ready? That's what I thought they were doing. But I met the kid when he's three, and he's reading. The kid was actually reading. And he's fascinated by letters. And my wife said, I'm going to make him a shirt. Would you want to go you know, pick out the fabric with me? I'm like, heck yeah, I love that stuff. <laughs> and so I saw this fabric, and I said, can you make me a tie? <laughs> So anytime I go somewhere, if you know it's important to me, I'm wearing this tie. Um, but that kid, it didn't matter. I mean, he figured out how to read on his own. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to me where a kid at three years of age, right? You guys are school board members. Does it make any sense that a three-year-old would figure out how to read on his own? It doesn't. But then people ask me, you know, I know people can listen to a song on the radio, and then they go play it on the piano. How do they do that? I don't know that either. There's just things we don't know because our brains are impressive. Uh, but the major problem is kids at the basic level, those are kids who have the skills who could become proficient. We're really interested in kids becoming proficient and advanced. But right now, we have a ton of kids who are at the basic level and a lot, 40% in Kansas and 37% nationally, who are reading below the basic level. And what happens is, and we'll see later, and this is where their stuff kind of kicks in, these kids are more likely to have very negative attitudes about themselves. Because you, if you ask a child before they go to kindergarten, what do you want to learn when you go to school? What do you think they all say? I want to learn how to read. I want to learn how to write. They want to do, in fact, you know, you remember, and your grandkids even now, are, if they're not going, to, if they're just the year before kindergarten, they're, they're scribbling stuff. You're like, hey, what are you doing? And they're saying, I'm writing, right? They're so invested and interested in doing that. Every child is motivated to learn how to read. So when you get into kindergarten and the strategies that are being taught to you don't make a lot of sense, actually you're neurologically different than other individuals, and you see other children who are learning how to read, it tears them up. So we see kids at our center who even in kindergarten and first grade have anxiety about going to school. You know, they say things like, my tummy hurts today. I don't really want to go to school. And they take the temperature and check them out. Well, you're not sick. Well, that's anxiety. They don't want to go to school. And some of the adults that, you know, Dr. Pritch was talking about who don't want to engage in the school system, they weren't taught how to read, and they actually have bona fide cases of post-traumatic stress disorder. So they tell their kids, I'm going to go to your parent-teacher conference this time. I swear I'm going to do it. And they get in the car, they start sweating. They get closer to the school, they're getting more sweaty. They get out of their car and like, I don't know if I could do this. They get up to their door and like, nope, I can't. I can't do it. That's post-traumatic stress disorder. And so as a system, I think the th important message I want to give to you today is number one, this is a systematic problem. It's a problem all across the board. And number two, we know what to do about it. So that's the good news, I think. We know what to do about it. We just need to get people on the same page. Another piece of the history of that story, uh, there were four or five parents in New Jersey and on the East Coast, when they come to conferences like this, they get on, on trains. And they just travel on trains and they talk to each other, read books, whatever they want to do. But these four or five parents were saying, you know what, I'm really sick and tired of school systems telling me they don't have to do anything for my kid that has dyslexia. We don't know how to teach them how to read. We're not, we just don't know anything about it. It's a medical problem, which it's not. It's not a medical problem. But they were tired of that. So they created a, a grassroots uh, parent organization called Decoding Dyslexia. Some of you guys probably have heard of Decoding Dyslexia. Uh, I think the term actually is really clever because decoding is an essential part of learning how to read. And we're still figuring out dyslexia. I mean, we know how to teach kids with dyslexia how to read. We know what to do with them to help them become competent readers. Um, but we're still trying to figure out neurologically how they process things differently than people who are good readers. And we know a lot about that, but we don't know everything. So I still think that notion of decoding dyslexia is a really good term. And if you look at the United States, there are 47 states that have or are considering legislation in dyslexia. I mean, we're working on it in Kansas. And all of that effort has come about because of this grassroots effort. Because there were four or five parents, and that was 2011 and 2013 when I found out about them, they're in 47 states and two provinces in Canada. So when they're saying, hey, I'm tired of my kid not learning how to read, and parents are going, what did you say? Hey, I'm tired of that too. 
So uh, this is a, 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 a force, a force to be reckoned with. And then on top of that, like pouring gasoline on the whole thing is Emily Hanford, who's an education uh, researcher, uh, a reporter. Uh, she did a podcast, a series of podcasts called Soul to Story. And if you have to commute anywhere, I'd highly recommend uh, listening to that because it kind of goes over the history of how we got on the wrong side of things and then how we're trying to creep back to the right part of things. Uh, so I would certainly recommend that. Firstly, you know, I, you don't need to know a lot about me, but I'm a research scientist. I got into this uh, not because I have a child who has dyslexia, not because I know anyone in my life who had dyslexia, but the research piece of it was extremely interesting to me. Everything that I wanted to do in terms of research, because if you'd asked me when I was a kindergartner what I wanted to do when I grew up, I'd have told you I want to be a scientist. I, I'm that person that's like, show me the data. He's a data guy, show me the data. And it's a real, I'm a pain in the rear for my family because my wife said, do you read that study on such and such? And I said, yeah, but there's two other plausible explanations for what's going on there, right? Um, and when people say things, I'm like, show me the data. I'm born in St. Louis, so I'm the show me state, show me the data, or I just don't believe you. And so um, the things that I do, I, I work at the Center for Reading at Pittsburgh State University. I'm now the executive director. Uh, Daniel J. Shipp, who is our new president at the university, uh, has dyslexia. He struggled to learn how to read. Um, he felt like he was disappointing his parents when he didn't learn how to read. And he still struggles to some extent reading, but he reads everything. <laughs> he sends me text messages, things he've underlined what he's reading. I'm like, oh my gosh, dude reads everything. Um, so we can get people who have dyslexia and reading failure, we can get to the point where they're capable of reading. And there's some other things that I'm involved with, but they're all related to helping kids become competent readers. So some of the things I want you to know about, because I'm going to act like you don't know anything about any of this, probably that's not true, but I always find that getting us all on the same page is usually the first way to go. So firstly, a specific learning difference. I, I like the term learning difference although it is a disability. There's no doubt about that, the fact that it's a disability. Uh, and if it weren't a disability, then it wouldn't be part of the uh, Individuals with Disability Education Act, right, IDA. And so uh, it's something that is covered. People can be in special education. They're protected under uh, Section 504 of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so it, it isn't just a learning difference. It is a disability, but we all think differently. And I think that's one of the beauties of being humans is that whatever weakness I have, somebody in here has that weakness as a strength. And whatever weaknesses you have, someone else has that as a strength. And we don't need to talk about our weaknesses, right? We just don't need to. We just talk about our strengths. But children who have reading difficulties, they're between a rock and a hard place every single day of their life. Because when, when they're in school, they're desperate to learn how to read and they're not getting the help they need in a lot of places. And they go home, their parents love them, and they want them to be competent in their lives, and they know to do that, you have to get through some level of education, and to get through some level of education, you have to know how to read. And so parents get really frustrated when their kids can't read, because they're like, you know everything there is to know about the Kansas City Chiefs or uh, the Shockers here, in Wichita, you know, you know, all the stats, you know, I know you're bright, then why in the world are you not learning how to read? Hmm, you must not be motivated, and I'm gonna help you with that. And so we actually see kids who have dyslexia are more frequently physically abused by their parents than kids who don't have reading disabilities. And strangely enough, it's because parents love their kids. And of course, who drives you the craziest, right? Your spouse, your kids, your family members. They're the ones who've got your buttons. You know, they know what to do with that. And, and so if you desperately want your kid to learn how to read and they, they seem to be bright enough to learn how to read, which actually we know there's really not a correlation between intelligence and reading. You know, we can teach practically anyone to read. In fact, the oldest person that we taught to read at our center was 63 years old and he also had intellectual disability, which is the new term that's been around for a while for mental retardation, right? So intellectually disabled, you would expect that he would have a difficult time learning how to read, but we taught him how to read. So it's not an issue with regard to intelligence. 
We know that people who have dyslexia have difficulties with accurate and word fluency and recognition. Obviously, they're looking at words and they can't read them. I mean, that's a major problem. Poor spelling is something we see with kids who have reading difficulties as well. And in reality, if you can't read, you're going to have some terrible time learning how to spell, right? And actually, even if you can read well, because of our English writing system, which we'll get at in a little while, uh, is challenging enough that sometimes you know how to read a word, but spelling is a whole different story, like accommodation. Is that two C's, one C, two M's, one M? Why does it have two C's and two M's anyway? Why is that the case, right? So we, we do have a bit of a challenging writing system, and that's part of the issue. We know that the uh, major difficulty is children who don't learn how to read very well have problems uh, with phonological processing. And phonological processing really is the notion that children understand that words are composed of smaller units, phonemes. And phonemes where it's at. When we're teaching kids to read, we teach them the sound that goes with the letter, right? So phoneme is where it's at. That's really the most important thing. One of the, this is the, uh, I'm stealing these concepts from the International Dyslexia Association's definition of dyslexia. One that is true, but not really true. I mean, it is true. Dyslexia can occur even with effective classroom instruction. You are born genetically with the potential to have dyslexia. So the fact that you're getting an appropriate classroom instruction or not isn't going to really change the fact that a person has dyslexia. The part I don't like about this is that somehow implies to some that we give effective classroom instruction, a kid doesn't get it, then that's on him or her, not on us. In reality, as teachers, by definition, if we're a teacher, someone has to be doing what? Learning, right? If they're not learning, my dad taught uh, graduate level um, electrical engineering at St. Louis University when I was a kid. And uh, one of the things he told me that has always stuck with me as a teacher myself is when my class did poorly on exams, it was a reflection of me, not them. Well, I, don't, I know that's not entirely true because there's some people like, well, I don't really care about your test or your class, and I don't even like you, so why would I try? Um, so I know that that's not entirely true, but you know, if people are really attempting to do, do something and do something well, and you're the instructor and that's not happening, then it is a little bit on us to figure out what we can do to help them. And so then, obviously, secondary consequences, you know, if you can't read very well, then comprehension's terrible. You know, and one of the things that I, I'm certainly a proponent of addressing is the individual uh, education uh, program, uh, IEP, right? So a lot of times in IEPs, they're going to say, well, we want kids to read 80% accuracy. Let me get a piece of paper for you and knock out 20% of the words on that page and see if you can read it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Neither, neither 90%. You know, so what's important is, uh, I think, too, we need to figure out how to, to write IEPs so that kids learn how to read, not that we're just getting them to get to this particular bar and then, because they're not going to read. And in fact, you know, when, the, when you asked earlier about, you know, uh, what's going on with reading and writing in terms of good citizenship, you, if you can't read, that's going to be a problem. It just absolutely is a problem because we learn infrequent words. We learn how other people think and act. In fact, there is a program in Brazil that for every book they read and write a little report on, they get four days off their sentences if they're in prison. <laughs> so, and they can get up to 48 days a, a year off their, their uh, sentence. And you think, well, that's crazy. Wouldn't they just cheat on them? I mean, they are criminals, right? Um, <laughs> but they don't. They don't cheat on it. And one of the things that's important about reading books is we learn how to be empathetic about other people. You know, so reading books is an important thing. And so you know, there, there are countries that kind of recognize that, and it's important. And so obviously, too, if you can't read very well, you're going to impede the vocabulary development of an individual. And you know, when you're taking, I know a lot of institutions aren't looking at doing the ACT or the ACT anymore. Uh, however, you know, those vocabulary words that are on the ACT and SATs, you don't, you don't hear them by listening to people talk. 
in a language environment, typically you don't hear those words by listening to people in movies or on uh, in music or on TV. You don't hear them, you have to read them. If you can't read, you just don't get there. It just doesn't happen. So some characteristics of kids who have dyslexia. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, we, we can identify kids who have dyslexia based on phonological processing things, and we can look at neurologically how they're processing things. So we know that they're kids no doubt whatsoever who have dyslexia. But I'm also concerned about those individuals who aren't learning how to read. So when I talk about reading, I'm interested in, I don't really care if we get down into the weeds about what, whether it's dyslexia or not. I don't, I don't care what we call a child. If they can't read and they can't read well, we're interested in helping them. I mean, as school board members, we want to increase the achievement levels in reading. And if we don't do that, then unfortunately, when you hit 18 or 19 and you leave school and become an adult, you don't magically learn how to read. So today we have between 93 and 120 million adults in the United States who do not read well enough to apply for a job, to take their medication, to apply for housing or loans or any of those things. So the inability to read is a marked disadvantage for any person in our culture today. You go back 200 years ago, whether you read or not, whatever. Does it didn't as, it matter as much. I mean, we always wanted people to read, but you could be a farmer and never really do much reading. Or you could be a mechanic and not do a lot of reading. You could do a lot of production work and not know a lot how to read. Most of our production jobs are outside the United States. I mean, there are, obviously, in Wichita, you, when you come in, you see all aircraft stuff. There's things that are being done here, but the vast majority of a lot of things that were produced are produced outside this country. And so if we can't read, then we're in trouble. And that's, that's real, a major difficulty. What's interesting too is I think a lot of times we look at high school graduation, we, we in the United States will brag often that we have 98, 96, 98 percent graduation rate. Not true. Not true at all. If we look at kids who start in our school system as kindergartners and we could track them until they get to be 18 and see how many of them graduate, it's more like 71 to 84 percent. That's terrible. In our country today, if you can't read and you don't, have a graduate, you don't graduate from high school, what are you going to do? And there's just not much. I mean, granted, there are people who say, well, I, don't, I didn't need to have a college degree. I'm doing really well. I'm a business owner. I do all these different things. But, but the fact is you could read. You know, if you don't get education and you can't read, then it's, it's bad news. We already talked about parental abuse. Actually, a study in Canada that was done, and they looked at... Uh, 13,000 individuals who they're following around asking them questions. And one of the things they ask them is, how many of you were physically abused by your parents? And 77% said they were, which is a lot. I mean, we don't want any kid really abused, physically abused, but if you're a parent, you know there's times when your kids are like, I like to just throw them out of the second story window, right? They're driving me crazy. Um, so it's a normal human emotion, but we don't have to necessarily act on it. When they asked individuals who had dyslexia what, how many of them had been physically abused, abused by their parents, it was 35%. Huge difference, huge difference. And, and that's a, obviously a major problem. They're more likely to have poor self-esteem. And what I mean by that is they don't think they can do anything. If you can't read, you really want to learn how to read, you see some of your friends reading and you're not reading, you think, well, I'm just not very smart. And the thing is, that just doesn't affect them with reading. It affects them with math. It affects them with every other thing they're learning. And then they start thinking they can't do other things, like can't do sports, they can't do music, they can't do theater, they can't do anything because I'm not good at anything. And that's not good for us either. They're more likely to have anxiety and depression. You know, as I said, at our center, uh, we evaluate children for uh, reading difficulties and attentional issues. And, uh, we ask them a lot of questions and we give them something called the behavior assessment system for children and that gets us at their psychological and emotional functioning and they have high levels of anxiety at the end of kindergarten and first grade. It morphs into depression, suicide ideation. We see kids that say, I wish I were never born, I hate myself, sometimes I think about killing myself and those are all things uh, we don't want to hear 
And those are things that we can help, not necessarily all of it, but a lot of it we can help if we teach them how to read. The reading piece causes a lot of harm for kids psychologically and emotionally. It's not just an academic issue, it just isn't. Uh, when we look at individuals who use drugs, and we're learning this through the opioid ep epidemic, generally people, I think a lot of times society thinks people who use drugs are just loser people. I mean, they're just terrible people that use drugs. But in reality, people use drugs to escape from pain. And the physical pain that people are uh, trying to escape from, and they're given opioid medication for things they didn't need that for, that was overkill, and they got addicted to it. There's a drug they used to use with people who are pregnant called Stadil. You can get addicted to Stadil in two days. Why would you prescribe a medication that you could get addicted on in two days? That seems crazy to me. Um, so individuals who are trying to escape from pain, it's not just physical pain, but psychological pain and emotional pain. And when you're not learning how to read and you really wanna learn how to read and you feel like you're a loser, you're more likely to engage in using um, illegal substances. And then, of course, they're going to find themselves in the juvenile court system and then eventually, potentially, in the prison population. And there's really only been one study that kind of loosely looked at the number of people in prisons who uh, can't read very well, and it was in Texas. And it's there around 60 to 70 percent. And that's not to say that if we taught all individuals to read, they wouldn't do naughty stuff to find themselves in prison. But, but when you think about it, if you can't read and you drop out of school, what are you gonna do? I mean, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do for a job? You know, and you're gonna, like when you're in high school, I know some of you guys worked when you're in high school, I did, and you're like, man, I'm making a lot of money, this is awesome. But it was peanuts compared to what you're gonna make if you stayed in school. If you dropped out of school thinking you made a lot of money, that it's really not a lot of money. Today it's even harder to you know, live on that amount of money. So. Um, you know, public assistance is something they're going to need as well. And so we really truly view this not just as an academic problem, but a social problem. Um, and I'm not here to tell you that all of our social ills would be solved by teaching kids how to read, but I guarantee you a lot of them would. There is absolutely no doubt about that. So I want to talk about some successful individuals too, because some of them, just by talking about them, they have some interesting stories. Some of these guys you've probably heard about. Uh, Dr. Ellen Tausig, uh, she's one of my favorites. Uh, she was an individual in the 1920s who had dyslexia, had a difficult time learning how to read, but she wanted to become a doctor. In the 1920s, there weren't very many, many medical schools that allow women in. They just wouldn't. Uh, it wasn't until the 1940s that people figured out when people went to World War II and the women did the jobs like, oh, women can do that too? What a shock, right? But, uh, but at that time, you know, to get into med school is very challenging. And if you're a woman, a lot of times they wouldn't even let you. And she got in. And some of the things that, that she did, she, she co-founded uh, pediatric cardiology. And some of the uh, techniques that they developed back then, they still use today. So, I mean, she's amazing. And part of the way through her career, she started to go deaf. And so she couldn't use a stethoscope to listen to the heart. She'd put her fingers on the kid's chest and could tell what was going on with the heart. An amazing person, right? Just an amazing person. Steven Spielberg, you know who he is. Bella Thorne, I used to put that on there for the younger individuals because she was in a, you know, the, the Walt Disney group of kids. But Henry Winkler, we all know Henry Winkler. He's, he's out a lot. He's pushing some of his books now. And I think Henry Winkler and Dave Pilkey are both two interesting individuals because they struggled to read. And Henry Winkler still really can't read very well at all. Super nice guy. Uh, but his parents didn't understand what to do to help him. And they were cruel to him, uh, emotionally cruel to him. And in fact, they were, they spoke German, they called him Dummerhund, which means dumb dog. Can you imagine your parents calling you a dumb dog? You know, as a little kid, I'm the dumb dog. You know? I, don't know, I don't know how Henry got to where he is today you know, and be such a nice person. You know, it's, it's amazing to me. But the point with Henry Winkler is that he's writing books. And you're like, how can he write books if he can't read, right? But I think the important message there, and I think these are messages we need to tell our children, you know, all of us in this room probably can write pretty well, be my guess. How many are nationally known authors? Many fewer, right? 
right? And so to be an author, you have to have a story to tell. That's how you become an author. Stephen King, King is a great author because he has many, many stories to tell and he's a good writer. And so the way Henry Winkler writes is he writes with a co-writer and he says, here's what I want to write about and they argue about it and then they write it. So, and then Dave Pilkey, um, if you know Dave Trebert very well, you know that almost all Davids are, right? We're a little crazy. <laughs> if you're married to a David, you know that's true. Uh, so David Pilkey, this is David Pilkey. When he was in second grade, his teacher said, you know, I don't know what to do with you. Just go out in this hallway. Do whatever you want to. I don't care. I don't want to see you in my class. So he's out there and he started drawing stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen Captain Underpants, right? I remember when my kids brought that book, I'm like, there's a book with a kid with a diaper on? What is this, right? Uh, but Dave Pilkey, he writes that in, in Dog Man and other books, translated in many, many other languages. Uh, I don't know if he's a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever he is, but he's made a lot of money. When he was in high school, he worked for Pizza Hut. You know those little clacker things that made the name tags? The E didn't come out. So he goes, I'm going to spell my name D-A-V. So it's not Daff Pilkey, it's Dave. He's, his name is David. But. <clears throat> and then Sherry, sure, you know him, and then Jack Horner. Um, I have him last because he's also one of my, I, I like all these individuals. And there's hundreds or thousands of people we could put on this that you would know. Uh, Tom Cruise has dyslexia. Uh, Chandam Tatey has dyslexia. There's lots of people who have dyslexia that you see in film. But Jack Horner is the most famous paleontologist on the planet. And the sad thing about him is his dad was valedictorian of his high school class. And Jack couldn't read. He tried, he tried like the devil. He couldn't read. And no one could teach him how. And if you listen to him, there's lots of stuff on YouTube with Jack Horner talking about um, dinosaurs and his work with dinosaurs, which is amazing. Because when I was a kid, we read dinosaur books and basically the notion was the dinosaurs laid their eggs and just ran off and let the little dinosaur offspring take care of themselves. And Jack Horner looked at nesting patterns and went, no, parents actually took care of their dinosaur offspring. He was the first one to discover uh, an embryo, dinosaur embryo. Uh, but if you listen to him talk about his relationship with his dad, it wasn't great. And it's really, really hard to listen to. Uh, I don't, his, his dad didn't call it a doomerhunt, but you know, he didn't understand him. He didn't understand why he couldn't read. Uh, and, and Jack Horner will say, well, I graduated from high school with a D minus, 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 which basically says I didn't graduate. They just wanted me out. Um, so these are individuals who've been successful. There's lots of people who've been successful who've had dyslexia. But one of the things that's common amongst most of them is they've had family support trying to help them figure it out. And today, when we talk about dyslexia in the larger community, uh, people will tell you that uh, getting help for kids with dyslexia is a rich person's gain. And that is because frequently uh, they have to do evaluations out of the school systems that uh, generally can cost anywhere between $3,000 and $10,000, which most, I mean, that's a university professor. When I first was a university professor, I couldn't afford that. And then to pay $75 to $120 an hour for tutoring. Most people couldn't afford that. So we have to help kids in school. I mean, there's, there's just no doubt about that. The place for them to get the help is in school. And, I, and again, I'll, I'll iterate once again that the, you know, the most important thing is we have the solutions. We don't have to figure this stuff out. We don't have to say, let's put our heads together, see if we can figure out a way to help kids with dyslexia. We know how to do that. Some common myths. These are things that people think are true, but they're not true. So I want you to know this. Firstly, dyslexia affects boys more than girls. It does not. But for the men in the room, you can do earmuffs. I'm a developmental psychologist, and almost everything that can go wrong in humans goes wrong with men and boys more than females. Leadership. <laughs> That's it. It drives everybody crazy, <laughs> the leadership piece. Um, but with... Um, you know, generally, like if you talk about autism or intellectual disability or almost anything else, there's usually three to four times more males than there are females who have that particular issue. That's not the case with dyslexia. Dyslexia is about half and half. And years ago, we thought we would write a little children's book for the kids that came to our center so they'd know what dyslexia was. We talked about the brain, that they're not alone. There's a lot of people who have dyslexia. 
how the brain works, and what you can do to help yourself. Uh, but when we wrote the, the boy version of it, 80% of the main characters in children's books are males. So we wrote one for girls, and the character in, in here is a girl, you know, because uh, we wanted them to be able to understand themselves and, and kind of own that. If you're interested in those books, I'll leave, some, I'll leave you know, the ones I brought out for you if you want them, or you can see where you can get them. <clears throat> Dyslexia is a visual difficulty, you know, with le letter reversing. You know, almost everybody's like, oh, they mix, up, they mix up their letters and stuff, right? That's what dyslexia is. Like, here's the deal. There's a part of your brain, we're going to talk about the part of the brain, it's called the left fusiform gyrus. You don't need to remember that. But when we see stuff with our eyes, it travels back to the back of our brain, the occipital cortex. It deals with visual processing. And on the way back there, it's doing some processing. People are like, why would, they, why would that be the case? Why would it have something that's up here, we're seeing up here, and it has to go all the way through the brain to get to the visual cortex, why? Because it's also, there's some motor things that on the way there, it's already telling your eyes to, mo to look. Like your peripheral vision, you know, if you see something in your peripheral vision, you gotta look at it quick, because it could be something coming at your head. I learned that when I was in first grade. I was standing on third base, and, and the pitcher decided to pick me off. We couldn't steal. I mean, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he just didn't like me, I don't know. But I'm standing there looking at home base, and he threw the ball at the third baseman. He wasn't very good at throwing. And I see right about here, I turn my head, bam! First time I broke my nose. You'll notice it's not, it's, it's crooked. My nose has been broken like three different times. Not because anybody's hit me, but I'll just tell you that. But um, letter reversing is pretty common with any kid that's learning how to read. Because the issue when you learn how to read is you have to understand that letters represent sounds and that you have to decode those letters into the sounds when you're reading. That's why when a kid's looking at it, you have their finger on the book and they have a finger on the word they're reading, let's say it's dog, they go d, a, uh, g. They're decoding, right? So now they've, they've taken the letters, they translate them into the sounds, they go d, a, uh, g. Then they start synthesizing them or blending them together. D, a, uh, g, dog, 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 ah! That's important. So they figured that out. The problem is, before we get to that point where we understand that letters are represented by sounds, we have a very intimate relationship between print and sound, our brain flips stuff. It just does so. Like, if we took a picture, um, picking on Dave again, uh, if we took a picture of Dave and put him in Photoshop and we flipped his face around and said, hey, who is this? You'd go, that's David. You wouldn't say, I have no idea, I've never seen that person before. Because our brain automatically flips things like that. And so we're learning how to read. It's flipping stuff, trying to help us out. So B's and D's are terrible, right? Some of you guys even now like, oh yeah, B's. I sometimes get the lowercase B's and D's mixed up, right? It's common because they're actual reflections of each other's P's and Q's. And there's some other letters that drive people crazy. But when kids learn how to read, by the end of first grade, most kids are not flipping letters anymore. All kids flip letters. I mean, except for this kid who's three years old and reading, he probably never did. But he's unusual. You would almost say he's freakishly unusual, right? And, and just to piggyback on, uh, by the time he was five, he'd memorized the entire periodic table of elements. You'd tell him atomic weight and he'd tell you the, everything about it, I don't know. I'm like, dang, I want to see what this kid does when he gets older, right? Um, say what? But anyway, kids, some kids just have natural abilities like that. Um, so letter reversing is something that every child does, but when they learn how to read, that starts to stop. And the B's and D's, kids will continue to do probably end of second grade, sometimes in third. We know kids aren't done reading uh, until about you know, fifth through eighth grade. They're still learning some stuff. I mean, you know, reading is a very, very challenging thing for us to do. Um, so I just want you to know that letter reversing thing is not a, if like you see a kindergartner reversing letters like, uh-oh, mm -mm, not necessarily. It just means they don't have an intimate relationship between print and sound. When they do, that drops out. So that's not an indicator by itself because all kids do that. Individuals who are intelligent don't have dyslexia. What do you talk about that? Let, you don't want to tell Steven Spielberg, dude, you have dyslexia, you're not very bright. I'm not going to tell him the president of Pittsburgh State University, you have dyslexia, you're not very bright. Firstly, I know it's not true, right? But we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that because we know it's not true. 
there's no real strong relationship between intelligence and reading anyway. People with dyslexia cannot read. We teach kids with dyslexia all the time how to read. You know, they're, they are, they can learn how to read. There's no doubt about it. Dyslexia be outgrown. Uh, dyslexia can't really be outgrown. You know, individuals who even get to be competent readers are gonna be slow readers. In fact, in the, the German literature, and they have a different writing system, which we'll talk about later, they have a different writing system that's easier for kids to learn how to read in. And so they don't have non-readers like we do in the United States. We have non-readers. In Great Britain, we have non-readers. In New Zealand, we have non-readers. In Australia, any country that represents the English language with the English writing system is going to struggle. It's a very, very challenging writing system to learn how to read in. But it's not going to be outgrown. I mean, they're, they're always going to have that component to it. Um, some of them you may not know ever by how they're reading that they have dyslexia. And if, of course, if they just try harder, it's ridiculous. I'm going to show you a slide of a study that uses uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, and it'll show you beyond doubt that a kid is trying as hard as he or she can to learn how to read. That's, that's not the problem. The last person I have on here is just Einstein, because that's one that really gets on my nerves. Uh, people all the time go, don't worry, your kid has dyslexia, look at Einstein. It's like, he didn't have dyslexia. He didn't even have a math disability. Um, you know, that's just not who he was. Um, people have done biographies of Einstein who've gotten all of his parents' letters and read them all and then wrote the book. They, he was a good student from the time he started school. And that wouldn't be the case if he had dyslexia. Um, and, and actually, he was reading in German. Remember I said that was an easier one to learn how to read in? Just absolutely not true. And, and the only reason why that bothers me is when people put that on their websites, Einstein had dyslexia, and I'm like, well, what else have you got on there that we shouldn't believe? Because if that's not true, what other baloney are you putting on there? Because um, I, I think one of the problems is we have to understand what reality is and, and, and really deal with that. So the science reading part, I think a lot of times when people talk about the science reading, they're like, well, is that some kind of curriculum that's out there? Can we buy a science reading curriculum? No. Um, the reason why we call it the science of reading, like we know biology is a science, right? We don't have to say the science of biology. People are like, wasn't that redundant? I mean, biology is a science, we get that. We don't say the science of physics. We know that physics is a science. But in the 1920s, uh, progressive educators, and Horace Mann was one of them. I mean, he did a lot of great things, but he was terrible with reading. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, he said that if we taught kids how to decode the language in the process of learning how to read, they would be bored out of their minds and they wouldn't learn how to read. Absolutely not true. Because when kids are being taught through the methods that we've learned through science, how to teach reading, we find out they find it absolutely fascinating, bless you, that they're decoding and they're learning how to read and they're realizing once they read that if we know how to decode more letters, I can re read more. He was absolutely unequivocally 100% wrong about that. In the 1960s, a guy named Ken Goodman came about and said, hey, the way we should teach reading is a thing called this three cueing system. It, when the, we want them to get to meaning. And actually, there's no reading scientist who will ever say we don't want kids to get the meaning. Comprehension is the whole goal of reading, right? That's the whole goal. And so, you know, when they say we want, from the very beginning, we want kids to understand what the meaning is. So they say, well, if you don't get a word, look at the pictures on the page. Guess from the pictures. And if you don't get it from there, guess from the previous sentence. Can you figure out from the previous sentence or the sentence structure? And if you can't get that, look at the first part of a word and then just guess. That's not how you learn how to read. You know, that's contributed to the 40% of kids in Kansas who are not reading. That strategy. And it's still out there. I mean, we're fighting against doing that, the, the three queuing system, or MSV, sometimes they call it. Um, whole language, whole word. You know, uh, George Bush in the early 2000s saying, no, mm -mm, get rid of that. We got to really deal with the science piece. So the science of reading is. The reading scientists who look at how kids learn how to read, we're looking at how the brain functions, we look at information processing and motivation, uh, perception, sensation, all those things, the things that we know that we've vetted through science and that's related to reading 
that's an umbrella term that means everything that we know about reading that's been vetted through science, that's a science of reading. But we have to earmark the term science of reading because there's so much bogus nonsense out there that's not vetted in science. And that's what got us to this point. You know, guessing at words, Ken Goodman called it the psycholinguistic guessing game. You want to, here, any you guys piano teachers? Put a piece of sheet music on the piano and say, just guess at the notes. <laughs> are you going to learn how to play piano? You are absolutely not going to learn how to piano, play piano. And your parents are like, oh my gosh, we need to chuck this thing out of the house. This is terrible, this noise this kid is making, right? That's the analogy of how we're teaching kids how to read now. Guess at the word. It doesn't work. And for Ken Goodman, you know, uh, if, if, the, if the kid got to the word um, and the word was horse, but there was a horse picture and the kid said pony, that was okay. That was okay to say that. That's what I mean by psycholinguistic guessing. That's the meaning of it, right? But is, we have two words, pony and horse, because don't they mean two different things? Yes. So, see, it's ludicrous. And so we need to stamp that out. And it's going to be a slow process because we've been teaching pre-service teachers for decades in this particular process. And so people, when they get to schools, they're teaching that process that doesn't help kids to read. At Pittsburgh State University, we're trying to change that. And our goal is in 10 years to have fewer than 5% of kids in Kansas who are not reading at least the basic level or better. Less than 5%. I think it could be zero, but then, you know, there's probably some kids who have some particular issues that might make it very challenging. But all of these things and more are really what was involved in the science of reading. And I just want you to be, when you leave here, because you'll hear the term science of reading a lot, like, what is that? You know, what, all it means is everything we know about reading that we've, bet, we've vetted through science. That's what the science of reading is. So here's one of the reasons why you got kind of things off in the 1920s is they thought, you know, people acquire speech naturally. You can take any kid, like you can take a kid from Germany and adopt him in California, that kid's gonna learn how to speak English because we have what I call firmware in our brain. All we have to do is be in a language environment and that firmware helps us to acquire that language. That's how it works. I mean, people say they're learning how to to speak, in reality it's not. It's, it's not a learning process per se, it's a maturational neurological process. We just have to be in that environment and it just sucks it up. You know, kids at, at three years of age, their vocabulary is growing so quickly there's no way to explain it other than there's something embedded in there. Noam Chomsky called it the language acquisition device, but I think for us just like firmware is a good enough way to kind of look at it. Uh, so they thought, you know, if language is acquired naturally, all we have to do is just put them in an environment for them to realize that, well, why can't reading be that way too? And so like if you look at the adult brain over here, this is an adult that's listening to language. And it doesn't even have to be a language that they understand. Like if you don't understand Spanish and someone's speaking Spanish, that's part of your brain just boom, 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 lights up. And what lights up mean it's activated? That means neurons are firing. That means that part of the brain is important in terms of whatever that, what they're doing. So in terms of language comprehension and understanding, that's important. Look at a two-month-old infant. Do they know how to speak? Well, if they do, they'd be on every talk show and <laughs> their parents would be, you know. <laughs> Two-month-olds are barely awake for 10 minutes at a time, right? Um, but notice that when they're listening to speech, it looks like the adult way of processing that information, right? That's what I mean by firmware. It's already there. It's when we are born, genetically, our brain has already built that part of the brain that's important for us to acquire language. The same thing is definitely not true uh, with, with reading. Reading... Um, Neuroscientists refer to learning how to read as neuro, neurological recycling. And what that means is we're using a part of the brain that was built for something else to learn how to read. And that's why it's not very easy for us to learn how to read. Again, as adults, my guess is you don't even remember 
what it was like learning how to read. Yes? Can you go back to the time of reading? Yes. That one or? You know, and the brain is just incredibly, it's just incredible. I guess that's the only way to say it. Um, that's me saying I like to read. And our brain actually parses I like to read into words you understand. And you also hear the phonemes. I, I, ooh, I, k. You hear those, right? So our brain parses that acoustic information uh, in a way that our brains can understand it. And it's just something that's built into it. Like if I asked you to close your eyes right now, and you closed your eyes and I said, now when you open them, tell your brain not to look at, you know, that nothing's there. Don't process any visual information. It's just gonna be black when I open my eyes. Oops, didn't work. Because it just automatically processes, right? Uh, and the speech part of it is automatically processed. So speech development is definitely natural. It's a natural process. But learning how to read is pretty tough. Uh, even for kids who, you know, if we, if we teach them the incorrect strategies of how to read, uh, it's still going to be tough for them to read who are going to be doing it fairly naturally. Um, my wife's cousin's grandson, who at three was actually a pretty good reader, you know, I, I can't understand how he did that, but he defined the relationship between letters and sounds so that he could figure that out. But, you know, and we know that kids who know how, how to do the mechanics of reading, they just have to be exposed to words like four or five times and it becomes part of their, you know, their vocabulary. It's just in, in, their, in their ability to read that word. So what happens when we learn how to read? First and foremost, we have to have our speech. Spe it's built on speech. Uh, if we don't know how to speak a language, we can't read a language. That can make any sense. Um, and then we have to deal with phonological processing. And phonological processing is just our, under, our ability to process sounds. And that starts actually prenatally, and it develops. You know, when you're, you have to have phonological processing capabilities to actually do language, but some of that stuff's kind of built in. By the time you're four, it gets a little bit more complicated, the types of phonological processing they have to be able to do. And as an example, at four years of age, we can predict pretty well if a child's gonna have a reading problem or not. And we can ask them to do things like, say the word dog, and the kid says, dog. Say, now so without the d sound, the kid goes, og, they're probably going to be a good reader. Now, we want to do that 10 times, because uh, I'll explain in a minute. But if we say to a kid, say the word cat, and the kid goes, cat, and they say, now so without the t sound, the kid goes, kitty, cat, cat, dog. Those are the kids whose brains won't allow them to understand that words are made up of sounds. If you don't know that words are made up of sounds, you can't learn how to read. Now, some kids who are super bright, who have dyslexia in kindergarten, first and second grade, they'll memorize all the words. They'll look at the visual consolation where they'll see this C-A-T, they just go cat, D-O-G, dog, run, R-U-N. I mean, they, they just memorize the visual consolation of the word. The problem is, once you get to third grade, that crashes and burns. So we'll see kids in first and second grade who look like they're pretty decent readers, and then the third grade teacher's like, what do I do to this kid? I mean. Y'all said he was a good reader. <laughs> What's going on now, right? But they use that compensatory mechanism of memorizing all the words, and it just doesn't work. You know, in logographic um, languages, uh, kanji and some others, like in Japanese and, and Chinese, you know, those symbols, they represent syllables or they rep may represent just meaning. If you know 2,000 of those, you're considered an expert. Well, in third grade, you're surpassing 2,000 words. So if you're just memorizing words, then you can't do that anymore. You have to learn the mechanics of reading. That has to be done. So once they get the phonological processing stuff, and like I said, we can do that at four years of age. Several years ago, there was a superintendent who was at one of my trainings, and I said, hey, you know, do cat, dog. They have to be what's called consonant, vowel, consonant words, CVC ones a kid knows, like cat and dog and run and bat and things like that. I say, if you do that 10 times with your child, 
And you know, if they get many of them wrong, they're probably gonna have a reading problem. And if they get them all right, they're probably not. So he went home and he had a, a four-year-old son and he came back and said, yeah, my son couldn't do that. And uh, another teacher who was there, she went home and she had a four-year-old daughter and her daughter could. So we, you know, fast forward a couple of years, who was at our center to get evaluated for reading difficulties? The son, right? So we can do some, you know, like triage kind of stuff, you know, early on at four years of age. Uh, and then we can actually start helping them so that they can overcome some of these difficulties. So that <clears throat> once you get through phonological processing and understand that words are made up of sounds, then we start, have to start teaching them that those letters represent sounds and that we can use those letters as, as linguistic building blocks and understand that you can take like the, the B from bat, take that off and put the C on there and it becomes cat. You know, they have to understand how that stuff works. And that's what we're doing when we're teaching them how to read. And then we want to teach them how to decode. So when they get to a word, they're, they're translating the sound of the letter into the sound, which is decoding, synthesizing, and they're reading the word. Um, but it's also important for them to understand vocabulary, which we'll get to in a second, too. Um, and then as we're teaching them how to read, we want to teach them how to spell, because spelling and reading are reciprocal processes. And it's part of a code. So if we're teaching them the code in terms of how to decode to read, then we should be teaching them how to encode to spell. And spelling is more challenging. They're not, people are not as good as spellers as they are readers who are good readers. They're just not. Because the English writing system is pretty challenging. Yes? Uh, what do you think about the fact that they should teach you to write a four-year-old in class to read? Well... <clears throat> Yeah, you know, some of those things, if they're teaching them how to write it and they're saying the sound, what they're doing is it's a, it's a way we would call in cognitive science rehearsal. So like if you're writing the A sound down and you're saying ah, you're not really necessarily teaching them how to use all this stuff together to read, but that's an important part. When they get to learning how to read, they already then know that that letter A represents ah. Yeah. So those, those are things that we would incorporate in a good reading instruction program. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a way to go about that. Like, you know, almost 20 years ago, we wrote a curriculum. It's called the Secret Codes Curriculum that in, in kindergarten, we see very little reading failure rate. And it's backed up by uh, then the advanced uh, codes. That's a first grade one. But uh, <clears throat> what we do, just to kind of explain how this works, the first day we talk about what a code is. And kids usually, usually in kindergarten are really, really excited about a code. And if you tell them, we're going to teach you this secret code, it's not really a secret, but not everyone knows about it. You have to be a little detective to figure out the sounds that go with the letters. They get super excited. <laughs> you, can, you can get almost any kid to do anything if you call it a game, right? If you say, we're going to do some, uh, we're going to do some reading testing, like, Bleh. we're going to rating games, yay! And I mean, they're the same thing, but <laughs> they call it game, right? So... Um, so this, this next day we come in, we kind of review what's going on with the code. We show them the letter A and we say it's A. And they do those kinds of things, right? And they do manipulation of the A. We show where the A is in a word, not just like an ant, but we also show them t an. It can be in the middle of a word, you know, the new, word, the new letters then don't have to be the beginning of a word. The next day we review A and then we show them the N and it's N. And they do stuff with A and N then in practice and then the next day they do T. And on the fifth day of kindergarten, well, it's not the fifth day of kindergarten, I mean, the first week or two, they have to, to understand that their mommies are going to leave them at school and they need to hold their hand up if they go to the bathroom and what the rules are and stuff like that. Uh, you can't run home because it's lunchtime. You know, all the stuff that kindergartners have to figure out, right? Uh, but after they figure that out, the fifth day of the curriculum, we show them A and we ask them, what's this? They go, ah. And we show them the end and say, what's that? And they go, mm. They say, what's this? It's the T. And they go, t. I say, all right, now let's look at this word, ant. Let's do that. What's this, a? Ah. What's this, n? Mm. What's this, t? Let's put together, a ah, and t. Now, if they can decode, synthesize, and read ant, they can also read an and at and tan, right? And see, they're getting very excited because now they're learning how to read. That's the mechanics of reading. That's we have to teach that. If we teach that, almost every kid will learn how to read. If we teach them just guess at the word, I mean, even you guys, you're like, you're not reading science, you're just like, that doesn't make any sense. 
And when he said, put some sheet music on a piano and say, just guess the notes, that really didn't make sense. It's the same thing, right? We have to teach them the mechanics of how to read. We do that, we'll solve this reading problem. That's why this whole thing is called the reading problem is solvable if we understand the science of reading, because it is solvable. We do it every day. Uh, people come to us and say, help us learn these strategies. They're not challenging strategies. There's a lot to know, but you know, teaching is a serious business, right? So we want to teach spelling and reading at the same time because the reciprocal processes are the same thing, understanding the code. But that doesn't mean that you're going to be as good a speller because you know, it's just more challenging. It takes a different kind of memory. When you're reading, it's called recognition memory where you recognize things. When you're spelling, it's called recall. You have to recall the way that's spelled. It's just more challenging. Um, but if you teach them together, kids will like spelling and they'll like reading. Like I, when I was a kid, we learned to read in the morning, and then after lunch, we are learning spelling. Well, spelling's really boring, boring, disconnected from reading. Well, you know, we've done some things that we need to teach some things together. They actually do go together. And then vocabulary is really important. Uh, we want to develop vocabulary because the more vocabulary you have, the better reader you're going to be because you understand that the word you just decoded and synthesized is a real word. And of course, the whole goal of reading itself is to understand or comprehend. And that gets us to this really cool um, theory that, and if you guys have to go the rest of me, just get up and go. I don't really care. I'll just keep yakking. Um, I remember I was in graduate school when this came out. This is called the simple view of reading. And I remember reading it going, reading is not that simple. It's just not that simple. But what they were talking about is reading comprehension is a combination of word recognition. You have to recognize the word. And to be able to recognize a word when you're a beginning reader, you have to be de able to be de decoding a word. So decode, synthesize, read the word, right? The other piece of it is language comprehension. If you don't have very good language comprehension skills, then even if you decode well, you're not going to understand what's going on. And particularly that means if you don't have a vocabulary that you've decoded a word and you said it out loud and you're like, I don't know what that word is, then you don't understand the sentence, right? And then a whole, the goal is reading comprehension. So in reality, reading comprehension requires word recognition skills and language comprehension skills, both of them together. And what Go, Goff and Tunder said was that we can put an equation that language comprehension, let's say that's LC, decoding is D, and um, reading comprehension is RC. If a student has no decoding skills, they can't decode, they can't read. Those are kids who have dyslexia. If they have no decoding skills, they can't read. Now, granted, I already told you some kids memorize the, cons you know, the visual constellation of word. That only works up until about third grade, then they're done. Now, all of a sudden, now they're terrible readers because there are too many words to know. So if decoding is zero, zero times anything is zero, right? So reading comprehension, zero. Uh, if a student has good decoding skills but terrible language comprehension skills, that's also a zero reading comprehension skills, zero. Like if you guys took Spanish in high school and you still remember how to decode, you know, because uh, the vowel sounds in Spanish are always the same. They don't change like they do in English, right? So you can look at stuff, you can read, and you're like, oh my gosh, listen to that person. They're reading Spanish, cool. Like what did, they, what did you just read? I don't know, because you don't have the vocabulary. You have to have the decoding skills and the vocabulary to have reading comprehension. So I mean, really, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Now, reading itself is complicated, but when you're looking at how comprehension works, this model works out pretty well. Simple view of reading. So I, I like to, I, I didn't normally just talk about the simple view of reading. I just talked about if you don't have any, if your vocabulary is weak, you're going to have weak reading comprehension. But these guys really kind of explained it pretty nicely. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is that we want to help kids early on. We want to help kids early on for lots of reasons. Number one, that's the appropriate time to be teaching this stuff. And the kids that are getting off base, let's get them back on track. Let's get them on track right away. Um, because if we don't, what happens is the red squares, those are good readers, they keep getting better. And the blue squares, 
they're getting a little better, but that gap between them and the Goodreaders is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We talk about closing the gap, right? That's what we're talking about, closing the gap. Well, let's not create a gap in the first place. Let's teach with the science of reading so that we don't have a gap. I think that's important. Uh, Keith Stanovich came up with a concept called, and Stanovich was one of those individuals from the 19, late 1970s till now, he's still around. He still does amazing work in the reading area, and he's taught us a lot about how the mechanics of reading actually work. But one of the things he showed us is that if you look at poor readers and the average reader, the average reader is reading you know, roughly about a million words. Many of them are the same, obviously. But I mean, if you just look at how many words, they're reading a book, how many they were, ding, 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 count them all up, they're reading about a million words per year. Poor readers are reading about 100,000 words per year, and most of them they're reading incorrectly. But you can see, who's going to have the bigger vocabulary from reading? That's pretty clear. Who's going to have the bigger uh, world knowledge based on their ability to read? Those people. No doubt about that. And then if you want to look at voracious readers, um, <clears throat> voracious readers can read 100 million <laughs> words per year. That's crazy, right? That's crazy to even think about that. It dwarfs even the good readers, right? My wife is a voracious reader. Uh, she, she's not reading right now, but she reads a book a day, at least a book a day. I don't. I'm a reading scientist, so everything I read is pretty complicated. So I might, it might take me an hour to read 10 pages because I'm doing a different type of reading. And see, the problem with that, and not necessarily that I think it's a problem, but the issue with that is I'm not going to read super fast anything then. Because if you're training for a 5K race and you run every single of your training miles at 20 minutes per mile pace, you are not running a 10-minute mile pace when you're in the 5K race. So if you're used to doing something slowly, you're going to continue to do something slowly. Like my wife wants to talk about the book she's reading. She goes, let's read them together. I'm like, you've already read three books by the time I finally got this one done. Right? So she's a voracious reader. And so you know, her vocabulary is crazy because every day for lunch, I go home for lunch, and we do the uh, New York Times crossword puzzle. And if you do those, like Monday's easy because like, and then Tuesday's harder. By Wednesday, Friday, it's like really super hard. Well, one of the clues, she comes up with the, the name. I'm like, well, how did you even know that? Because I read, right? She always says, because I read. She reads everything. Um, so some of the words that she knows, I don't know. Just a little teeny bit, uh, and you do have a hand, handout on this, but um, <clears throat> I want to talk just a teeny bit about ADHD because roughly 30 to 50% of children who have dyslexia also have attentional deficit hyperactivity disorder. And when you're learning how to read, it is essential that you have e enormous concentration abilities. So if you have difficulties with attention or concentration, you're going to have a tough time learning how to read. In fact, years ago, one of the faculty members in my department had a daughter who was in third grade at the time and said, hey, they're putting my daughter in a Title I reading program. You know, what can I do to help her become a competent reader? So we did an evaluation. We found out she had all the skill set to be a good reader, but she had ADHD primarily in attentive presentation. And those are the individuals that are sitting there, but their brains are somewhere else. I mean, we all do that a little bit, so that doesn't mean we have ADHD. Uh, but if, and she decided to use medication. Three weeks later, she's in the best reading group because she got to develop those skills that she actually had. <clears throat> and I want to talk about the definition. Um, but the subtypes, I think it's important for you to know there's primarily inattentive presentation. And these are kids who are not getting out of the chair. They're sitting in their chair, but they're, they're just somewhere else. Um, you guys can do that on purpose. Like you're in a meeting, you're like, wow, it's super boring. Hey, remember we're at vacation in the beach? And you're like, oh, you're at the beach, right? I mean, you could do that right now <laughs> as you have those abilities. Um, but they're not causing trouble. You know, the kids who have ADHD, permanently hyperactivity, impulsivity type, these are the ones that are getting out of the chair, running around, you know, turning the light on and off, doing the channels. You know, um, they also try climb trees like, hey, I wonder if I can fly. Oops, no, I can't, you know. So they do some really dumb things because they don't think about the consequences of their behavior. They just don't. Um, so those are the subtypes. I just kind of want you to know about that. I also want you to know that it is genetic. We're not going to go really through the genetic piece of it. But these are three different gene locations that they are looking at right now in, in regard to 
dyslexia because we know that we are the sum of our genetics, right? I mean, even our prenatal brain, our brains are developed as a function of the genetic code. And in fact, this is crazy, but part of our genetic code has the first organism that actually had a brain was a flatworm. We still have a teeny bit of that. We built upon it to be better. Like our brains are enormously complicated, uh, but they're not the most complicated nor the biggest brains in, in the human uh, or in the animal kingdom. But if you look at the base of our brains, the holes that the arteries go in, they got bigger over time, which means you know, like if you watch those uh, Fast and Furious movies and they talk about NOS, they turn on the NOS, <laughs> that's what our brains do. Because we've got an enormous amount of glucose and oxygen that get to our brain that fuel our brains that other organisms don't have. So we're incredibly intelligent and very fast at, at doing that. And, just you know, a little piece about the brain, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, my favorite gene is the DCDC2 gene, and one of my friends in Germany has been working on this. And what he hopes to be able to do is show that there's a relationship between dyslexia and this gene, and then do blood testing to know if they have this gene or not. And then at three years of age, do some what's called QEEG testing to see if this is actually being played out because. The other piece of the genetic issue with humans is that, like we know if we take a blue flower and a yellow flower, we're gonna get a green flower, right? But that doesn't happen in humans. You know, our genetics are more complicated. So you can have people of dark hair, blonde hair in five generations, and then the next generation you have someone who has red hair, and you're like, how did that happen? No one in our family that I know, of, because it just played out that way. That's how genes work, pardon? <laughs> well, that's what I, I always joke, but I don't know if that would go over here. So thank you for telling that one. Uh, yeah, it's, you're sort of like, did the man have the red hair? What's up with that? Yeah. Um, but that's how genes play out in humans. We're way more complicated. And not only that, our environment turns on some genes. Like you can have the gene for breast cancer in your family, and, you know, five people actually have that gene, and two people got cancer and three didn't. Why? because the environment turns something on. If you're exposed to some noxious part of the environment or you're a smoker that caused the gene to get turned on, that, you know, that's why smoke is related to so many things. It turns on some of the nasty stuff that we don't really want. Um, but the DCDC2 gene, it's the one that is actually building the brain prenatally. And <coughs> this particular slide uh, is a mouse brain. And here you can almost see the pathways on this side over here. And they left the DCDC2 gene in there. On this one, they took the DCDC2 gene out. They can do that by actually physically removing it from the actual chromosome, or they can make it inert by giving, uh, subjecting it to chemicals. And you can see then those neural pathways aren't being formed, right? The neurons are just sitting there going, where do I go? Do you know where to go? Like, I don't know where to go. No one told us where to go. So they don't build those pathways. And when we start looking at humans, <coughs> what we'll find is that there's two areas of the brain that look like this in terms of the reading process, and those connections are pretty weak too. So I like to talk a little bit about the brain. I know I'm cramming a lot of stuff in here, but there's a point to all this. And the point is that our brain is, allows us to, to learn how to read. And we have to understand a little bit about how the brain works. Firstly, there's a couple of things I want to tell you that aren't true about the brain. Number one, there's not such thing as right brain people and left brain people. Um, I know it's, it's, it's funny to say that, and people do have different personalities that kind of lend themselves to this notion. But in the middle of the brain, that little slit there, if you open it up and looked inside of it, there's a super highway called the corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres together. So whatever the right hemisphere is doing, the left hemisphere instantly knows. And whatever's going on the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere instantly knows. But the left hemisphere is a little teeny bit better in processing stuff initially than the right in some things, and some things are a little bit faster, but, but we're whole brain people. Some kids are born without a corpus callosum, and those are interesting kids to you know, look at because um, their brains aren't communicating. The two hemispheres aren't. The other thing is a lot of times people say that we only use 10% of our brain. 
Oh, granted, some of us act like that. <laughs> but in reality, uh, we use every single bit of our brain, every bit of it, 100% of it. And again, there's still things we don't understand because there was a kid that was uh, uh, prenatally, he had uh, a cyst that filled with fluid in his head. And if you looked at his, um, if you looked at his, fMRI or CT scan of his head, you'd see a big thing of nothing there. And then they told him, this kid's not gonna walk or talk, probably can't breathe, because all these things are messed up. And when the kid was born, they put a shunt in and drained it off, and the kid started developing, and they're like, what in the heck? We didn't expect this. And he still got problems, but they did a, a, another scan, and they found out that big hole, that big fluid-filled area was only this big now, and the brain kinda, how does that work? You know, did it get smashed and then it got unsmashed? You know, we're not exactly sure, but the brain is marvelous. You know, if you ever think of yourself, oh, I'm having a bad day, I'm, ugh. What you have inside your skull is, is the most amazing thing in the universe. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. So when we're learning how to read, you know, we're looking at, a, at text and that visual information goes into the eye, it hits the retina, a lot of neurologists kind of view the retina as part of the brain because it has the same kind of uh, cell structure there. Uh, and then you see that it goes all the way back to the back of the brain, right? It goes back to the visual cortex. From there it goes down to what we call the left fusiform gyrus. And that's the part of the brain that does fine tune analysis of the vision, like with letters. Uh, we're looking, when we're looking at letters, it's the one going, okay, what is this letter? What's going on here? And then it goes up to the planum temporal. Uh, which is going up and it connects the letters and the sounds together. And then it goes up to the front of the brain, which is called Broca's area. And Broca's area, it is involved with language, understanding language, spoken language, speaking language, all those things are going on up there. And so this has to occur when we're learning how to read. If this doesn't happen, we won't learn how to read. And if trauma occurs to this area down here, like if you are a good reader and you know, as you're writing, you know, walk into your car, someone throws a baseball or hits a baseball and hits right here and, and causes damage to that part of your brain right here, if you don't recover from that, you'll never read again, period. No way to get around it. You will never read again. Um, so this loop that we see is very important in terms of teaching children how to read and there's certain activities that have to occur, or certain experience they have to have to develop those. So if you look at a kid without dyslexia, you can see those three areas I was talking about, they're working just fine. Because when we highlight and put color on it, that means those neurons are doing something. Look at the kid with dyslexia. Those two areas that we talked about initially, they're not fired up at all, are they? And so the brain's going, hey, can you, the little red area, can you do this for us? Can you figure this out for us? And the red is going, I'm trying, I'm really trying, but my part of my job wasn't really to do that, so I don't know how to do that. So when people say that kids with dyslexia aren't trying hard enough, this is a neurological example that's 100% not true. They're trying everything within their power to read, they just can't. And I'm not gonna talk about this, but <clears throat> when you guys read, if you're a good reader, this is kind of what your brain looks like. Uh, we're, we're learning more and more and more that, you know, those, those areas initially are important in terms of developing those skills, but once we develop those skills, you're doing lots of other things. Like you're thinking about the plot development, you're thinking about what the character actually looks like, and that's why you go to a movie after reading a book, like, oh man, that's the wrong person. Like Jack Reacher, have you read any of the Jack Reacher books? I like Jack Reacher. Uh, Jack Reacher is how tall? Six foot. Six five? Six five, uh, not Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, guess what? He is here on me. And you may not be able to tell, but I'm, I'm not six foot five. <laughs> but we give Tom Cruise a pass. Number one, because he's a really good actor. Number two, he's a really good physical actor. And number three, as dyslexia, he has to memorize everything he does because he can't read. So I give him a pass because he's got dyslexia. Well, you don't have to give him a pass. Uh, he's got other stuff. I'm just looking at his acting stuff. I mean, you know, what other actors do? There's, there's a bunch of, everybody's got their thing, right? So, yes, sir? Yeah, 
Yes. And, and strangely enough, like this is what teachers do when teachers are teaching kids how to read with the proper methods, these things get developed. Even kids who uh, those part of the brains aren't ready for that to happen, uh, sometimes it takes specialized instruction. Like what we do at our center is specialized instruction. There's some things we do that would be far beyond what we do to teach a kid to read. Um, kids who have those ready to go that are taught with the wrong method, sometimes they don't develop. So, you know, that, that's why it's so important to teach with the correct methods. When we do that, we get kids to read. And the kids who can't read, then we can do some other things to get them to read. And, and actually, that's one of the next things. Um, you know, that, this is really important because once you've gotten this developed and you keep working and working and working, you know, it's like, you know, like Michael Jordan, he was terrible, he wasn't terrible, he wasn't very good at basketball in high school and he just kept shooting the basket and shooting the basket and all of a sudden, one of the best basketball players to ever play, right? Um, so what happens is when you do this enough, something called automatic processing occurs, which means you bypass this and you go right from print to meaning. Like when you read stuff right now, you're not doing decoding and synthesizing. You're looking at the words and going boom, right to the meaning, right? For most of you, it goes right to meaning. And the reason why that is, because we've, we've overlearned it to the extent it becomes an automatic process. Plus, for those whose brains are kind of, even though we're doing neurological recycling, but have the ability to do this, it only takes exposure to a word three or four times for that almost to be permanently stored. And I want to talk about that. But I do want to talk about this. Here's a kid without dyslexia. It's done by, this study is done by Gabrielli. And you can see those three areas we talked about. They're kind of lit up. Underneath the blue area is lit up, then the blue area, and then you got, you know, the red. They're lit up. So a kid with dyslexia, they're not lit up, right? They're not lit up. But if we give them the proper instruction, all of a sudden they start to develop them, which is interesting. You know, because the brain actually can rewire itself. You know, neurological, um, the ability to kind of rewire itself, the earlier you are at doing that, the better able you are. My son, when he was 32, we're all runners in my family. He got hit by a car, um, and he had extreme trauma to his, uh, his brain. Uh, he was in <clears throat> uh, the neurosurgical... Uh, ICU for a month, and we didn't know from five minutes to the next. He's okay, by the way. Uh, probably should say that up front. Usually teachers demand it. Tell me, is he okay? Okay, he's okay. Um, it's a miracle, really, a miracle of science that he's even alive, But because we didn't know from five minutes to the next if he's, he's going to live or not. And, you know, I, they allowed me to examine his CT scans because they understood that, you know, I, under, I understand how the brain works. So I looked at the CT scans. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is terrible, right? I told my wife he's going to be he's going to be deaf out of his left ear, um, and he, he who knows what's going to happen with his right hemisphere. But it looked terrible, and he is partially deaf out of his left ear now. Uh, but he's made a, a, a marvelous recovery, um, which I would not have predicted. What I knew about the brain at 32, you're kind of too old for your brain to do all that recovery, but it has. He's running, he's driving, he's a, he's a, working in a master's degree uh, right now. I mean. But that doesn't normally happen. But our brains are uh, amazing. You know, that's why I say if, if you don't feel like you, you know, it's been a good day, just know that you have the most impressive thing in the universe inside your skull. Yes? What to do if somebody is, let's say, in their late 50s with dyslexia, learning how to read? Uh, we, we've taught people in their 50s and you know, up to 63. The oldest person was 63. It's going to take a lot of effort because when you think about all the things you need to know by the time you get to be 53 in terms of reading, that's a lot to know. We can get them on the start of that journey. We teach them the mechanics of reading. No, it, it depends. You know, it depends on the individual, but uh, usually we see some progress in a few months. In six months, they're doing some stuff, and you know, it depends on the person, but they'll never be a quick reader, but they'll be reading. Um, and again, you know, like if you listen to the Soul to Story podcast, there's a person who was in World War II, I think it was, and he couldn't read. And a soldier died and said, can you give, you know, can you write down what I'm going to say so you can give it to my parents? He couldn't. And he felt terrible. But because he finally got someone to teach him mechanics of reading, he now can read. 
And he was, he's probably in his 70s now, or older, I don't know. It was when he's in his 70s, he learned how to read. So it's, it's never too late. It isn't. Unless there's something, you know, physiologically wrong. Yes. And actually, you have one of the best. Yes, the Phillips Fundamental Learning Center. Woohoo! I always call her my big sister. She's not really, but um, she's awesome. And she got in it for the right reason. Her son couldn't read, and the school's like, oh, we don't know how to teach this kid how to read. And, she, and you know, one of her friends said, you need to get in your car. You need to go to Texas. They're teaching this method there, and you need to figure it out so you can teach your kid how to read. You're going to save your child's life quite literally. Um, and she did that. It took a couple years. She came back. Taught her kid how to read, and then other people like, hey, 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 I got a kid. And another person says, I got a kid too. And then 2000 or 2001, do you remember, David? Was it 2000 or 2001 they started the Fundamental Learning Center? Somewhere around in there. I don't even know if Janine remembers, you know, the exact year, but. Yes, I was there for that. Yeah, so you got to see Emily Hanford, so that was, that's pretty cool stuff. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did the public education system move away from that? Because I'm told that you're not you're not pro public school. I'm like, you know, the public schools have made some mistakes. Let's look at the history of the public education system. Let's work our way through it. Let's admit that there's been mistakes. And our school district has started the science of reading because a parent with a child who couldn't read went and did her own learning, and now she's an employee. And Mm -hmm. the science of reading for yeah. years. Why weren't they doing the science of reading for the past 50 years? <clears throat> the simple answer to that is there's two parts to it. Number one, faculty and colleges of education weren't teaching pre-service teachers the methods. That's number one. Number two, like in psychology, we train all of our students who are going to be therapists. They have to be what we call scientist practitioners. They have to be able to understand the science. They have to go read science. They have to go to journals on whatever therapy they're using to see what the new approaches are, if they work or don't work. When we teach teachers how to be teachers, we don't teach them to be scientist practitioners. We teach them to be practitioners. That's their job. So they can't read the science. And you know, they were taught a method that they, you know, they, their instructors, they liked them. They, so they started using them. It made sense. I mean, we want to get to meaning really soon, so it makes sense. There's nothing in here that was contrary, so some of this stuff started before the science caught up with it. When the science started catching up, we're like, whoa, 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 we, we need to back up here. That's, that's this psycholinguistic guessing that you're talking about from the early 1970s. By 1980s, we're starting to look at it. And, and interestingly, uh, Stanovich and West, uh, I think they published it in 1988, um, I think, somewhere around in there, maybe a little earlier. Um, but what they did is they wanted, they thought, oh, this, this three queuing system, it makes sense. Let's see how it works. And what they did is they started looking at kids who were good readers and kids who were not good readers. And what they found was the good readers always decoded. They did the decoding route. The kids who were poor readers who could not decode, they were looking at pictures to guess at the words. They were thinking, okay, the sentence before it was talking about this, so I'll guess at this word. It was, that, was, that was what they were doing in desperation to learn how to read. Uh, and somehow it just, it just caught on, you know, and there's a lot of push for it. Um, and, you know, I, like I said, No Child Left Behind was all about trying to get back to the science of reading. And that's why I read Lion today. I mean, if you got him up here, he would go crazy. He is, like, um, he helped get past the No Child Left Behind legislation. And I was at a conference, and I really like Reed Lyon. He's a really interesting person, um, and he's a very likable person. And he's very smart and handsome and all that stuff. And uh, so I, I heard him speak and someone said, hey, if there's another piece of legislation you'd like to get passed, what would it be? And he didn't go, let me think about that. As soon as the person said, what would it be? He said, burn down every college of education across the United States. <laughs> that's what he said. Well, that's a follow-up question. What do the teachers learn if they're not learning, especially the ones with elementary education? Yes, education? They, they learn the three queuing system. They learn the three queuing system. And you know, in Kansas right now, we're in a really cool spot right now. This is really interesting. 
Kansas Department of Education is requiring, they have new standards they're putting out that says you have to teach the science of reading. The Kansas Board of Education, who oversees the uh, university, is saying you will get involved with the science of reading. Legislators are all saying we're doing the science of reading stuff. We need to fix this problem. Uh, and it's going to get fixed. It may take us a few years, but I've been doing this for 30, well, almost 40 years uh, that I've been working in this area. And right now is a very, very exciting time because now people are going, we need to do something about it. But again, I think it's because, you know, Read Lion, No Child Left Behind, people started looking at the research because No Child Left Behind said, so we need to talk to researchers about how to solve the problem. And then Decoding Dyslexia came out and they started pushing people to actually listen to what you know, researchers were saying. And then Emily Hanford said, hey, here's the whole story, listen to it. And teachers are listening to that and going, I want to learn how to teach kids how to read. It's not that teachers don't want this stuff, they just haven't been taught. You know, it's like if, you were, if you're an astrophysicist and you always look at the stars when you're a kid and you always want to be a, an astrophysicist and you go to school and they talk about astrology and you don't know any better, like, well, this is how we figure it out, right? That's not how it works. Yeah. So is there any teacher education program in Kansas for teaching that? Are there elementary teachers? <clears throat> uh, not 100%, but we're working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an organization called the National Council of Teacher Quality, NCTQ, and colleges of education generally hate NCTQ because they usually, NCTQ is kicking them, boom, 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 right? They don't like them. Um, part of the problem is, you know, when anybody tells you you're doing something not right, you, you know, I, you tell me, hey, I, don't, I think what you're doing is stupid, you're an idiot, what are you doing this for? I, I'd probably be a little defensive, right? We're getting there. We're, we are definitely getting there. And um, I think that's what is exciting now. And I, I think they're teaching some elements of it, you know, uh, like, like what NCTQ does, just to show you how this works. Uh, to get an A rating in reading uh, from the NCTQ, you have to, to show that you're teaching the five pillars of reading, which came out from the, uh, the reading um, from the No Child Up Behind, they had the National Reading Panel. They said these are the five things you, are really essential for reading. If you teach those and you don't teach any more than three of the bad stuff, we'll give you an A. Well, if you're teaching the bad stuff, you are, you are burying the rest of it. You, you cannot teach voodoo along with science. You can't. It just doesn't work. Um, it, it, it depends on how far you want to go with that. Like uh, Louisa Motes is a person who was a, was a teacher and there's all these kids that are failing at reading and she's like, I don't understand why they're failing at reading. So she got a doctoral degree to figure out how to help kids become competent readers. And then she realized that most colleges of education, I'm not saying all of them, I think most colleges of education are not teaching the real science pieces of it. So she said, that means that a lot of teachers, millions of teachers across the United States don't know this stuff, so I'm gonna do some training that they can do to learn this stuff. It's called Letters for Short, Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and, Science, or reading and Spelling. Um, we're working with science and reading, so I always, unfortunately, make a mistake when I say that, but it's Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. And it's a two-year process, and it's very hardcore. I think people can get involved with doing the right stuff really early on. In fact, when I wrote the Secret Codes curriculum, I knew they didn't know anything about the science of reading, so I scripted it so they would just say what they needed to say, and after a while they would learn it and they wouldn't have to memorize it. You know? So there, there's ways of dealing with these things, but we're, we're getting on the same page, which I think's, I think really exciting. Know the history. I, I want to know, I do, because I, I was all over the country about this stuff. But I, I want to know what is your impression? What did No Child Left Behind have to do about um, changing the way teachers teach reading? Because wasn't it No Child Left Behind, or it, either one of those others I mentioned, wasn't it those directives from the federal government, from the Federal Department of Education down, to start teaching this rote memory kind of thing? Memorize 
Um, <clears throat> well, it, it, it really goes back to the 1920s where, um, you know, Horace Mann thought that it would just be too boring to teach kids how to decode. And so they start saying, well, look at the words. The words are where it's at. Well, you got to decode to read the word. And, and so he was wrong about that. And then if you start looking at the history, like the Goodman stuff or psycholinguistic guessing, the Fontanus Pinnell, Lucy Calkins, like if you put in Lucy Calkins, she's getting crucified today uh, for really pushing these non-science-based, you know, ways of reading that actually cause harm to kids. Because, you know, like when you're in debate, if you've ever been in debate, you always talk about the dead bodies, right? There's, seriously, there are dead bodies because we're teaching reading incorrectly. Their kids are committing suicide. Their kids are using drugs. If they're using drugs, they can overdose on drugs. They're, they're, they're dropping out of school uh, at young ages. If you drop out of school, you're more likely to get in the sex trade because someone's going to abduct you. I mean, there's dead bodies all over the place when we're talking about not teaching reading correctly. But no child left behind was saying, we got to do the science-based stuff. And uh, it just didn't, you know, politicians had problems, you know, they all fought. And then, you know, when, when, you, when you start, when you say, well, how do we motivate schools to do this? Well, we'll penalize them. Well, then they started doing stuff because they, they needed the money and they didn't want to, you know, I mean, it, it just got messy. Uh, I think what we have to do is we have to get colleges of education to teach it properly. We have to, once teachers learn it, they're just like amazed. They're like, as an example, like, and I, I, some of this is personal experience, like the secret codes we wrote, they're going to adopt it in my school system. They didn't eventually do it because it was only kindergarten and first grade. They wanted something to go to fifth grade. I didn't blame them, not a problem. We're just here to help. Um, <coughs> but they wanted to test it first. And so they started in the springtime when it's supposed to start in the fall. And the superintendent, uh, the assistant superintendent there said I, he wanted me to meet with the teachers to make sure I could answer questions and stuff. So it was scripted so they get it and it's pretty easy. And so I met with them the first time and I, I you know, said, do you have any questions? They go, no. And I said, any problems? I go, no, this stuff, I mean, it makes sense, right? And a couple of them, there were five of them using it. Three of them came up to me and said, we each of us had kids that we didn't know what to do with in, in the fall. They weren't learning how to read. Now they're thriving, you know? So when we deal with the reality of the situation, we get really good results. So I, I, I think like, you know, we're, we're pushing people to do the right thing. Uh, it's, they'll figure it out. I mean, um, when teachers see how effective this stuff is, it is exciting for them because they want all their kids to learn how to read. And they know that they you know like they go home instead of spending 20 minutes on homework, they're spending three hours and they don't get to play baseball or football or, or do gymnastics or stuff because you got to do the homework first and it's terrible for parents, it's terrible for kids, it's just a bad scenario. Yeah. That, that's our goal, uh, and so we're saying it so we can be held accountable for, you said, um, what we're hoping to in the state of Kansas is have, rather than 40% of children who are reading below the basic level, have fewer than 5%. Now, we, we think we do better, way better than 5%, but we're going to just say 5% for now because that's way better than 40%. There's been studies 95%. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you could pin uh, or research it to say, do you really think it's 95%? I'm like, I don't know. I, don't, you know, I just really don't know. Because there are kids who now get to go to school who are on special education who are born without lots of cortex. They're not going to learn how to read. I mean, that's like a one in a several million, right? But there are other kids, there's some things that make it challenging for them. I don't know what that number is. But I, I think it's probably more than 95% of kids can read. Mm -hmm. What can we get home and do? Uh, I think, you know, right now, we want to okay, Let, let's, let's go to the end of this thing um, because there's some things. I really like talking about the English writing system because then you really see how crazy it is for a kid to learn how to read. Uh, but, we're, we're, but we're running out of time on that. But, you know, I, if you go to our website or you send me an email message, you know, we want to get out and start helping people you know, I do in-service training, you know, our staff is being developed to do that. You know, we're, we, we've gotten money from 
the Kansas government to increase what we're doing with reading. Um, so our plan is to do as much as we can, as, um, as much of the time we can until we get to that point. But I think the good news is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we know what to do. You know, we don't, have, like I said, we don't have to say, well, let's get us all together. I mean, that's what the whole point of No Child Left Behind was. The science is there, let's get everyone together to use the science. Do you have made a book for first, second, third grade teachers? Uh, kindergarten and first, it's a curriculum. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. There was a, a first grade teacher in Cleveland, Oklahoma, for whatever reason, had 70, 80 percent of her kids who were not reading by the end of first grade. It was driving her nuts because she's been a teacher for 20 years and she hated that. So she said to me, should I let him go to second grade? It becomes a second grade teacher's problem. Do I retain him? And if I retain him, what do I do? I've tried everything I know how to do. She said, can you use your curriculum? I said, of course, that's what we wrote it for. When I wrote it, my wife said, you need to give to schools for free, you know, but it turns out there's a lot of stuff that goes with it. Can do it. Um, but it's cheap over the long run. Like it never really gets, it's never out of date. It never. So the first, the first year that they used it, they went. Yeah, the first year they used it, they went from 70 to 80 percent reading failure rate to zero. All those kids are reading. The second year, all those kids are reading. The third year was a pandemic. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, but we're here to help. I think that's. I think the message I want you to know is we're here to help. There is help. We know what to do. There's no doubt. I mean, there's some kids, there's probably some kid that bring to me, like, we don't know what to do with this kid, and we work with the kid, and we're like, oh, well, we don't know either. I haven't met any of them yet, but I know they're out there. You know? Well, it is a crisis. It is a crisis, yes. I just want to respond to this gentleman. Uh, our district has started letters. We approved it um, in the past six months. Probably could pay for every teacher to go through the training. And that is good cost of money, but every every teacher in our district is supposed to go through letters. I mean, we're, we've been using this Wilson program. Mm -hmm. Wilson reading program. Which is all the... Yeah, really uh, good too. Stuff. So we've got Wilson trained people, and we are seeing and the teachers who, who did not know letters before, I went out and talked to some of the elementary teachers and they said, we feel guilty and sad that we did not know the damage we were doing to kids by not teaching them through, phon I call it phonics, that's what it was 50 years ago, yeah. the science reading. Well, and I'm just like appalled that this has been going on. Mm -hmm. Every teacher, or just every teacher student in this case. I think every teacher, because at our last <coughs> board meeting Monday, I said, what are we doing for the older kids who didn't get the science of reading? And so they're now in high school, or they get extra help. And they said, well, you've got to be careful with the social aspects of this and that. And it's like, well, we kind of got to do something. And they said they try to carefully pick and choose and help them out through different advisors and this and that. And it's like, and I would pay for a home program or something. So if they can't read, they're not socially responsible. Just give me a break. Well, because they don't want to mess up their social you know, going through the grades with their, their peers and stuff. It's like, you got to pull them and get we can, them out. We can do it at the same time. You know, that, we can do it at the same time. time. Um, I wish I'd do more. But you're right. I mean, when, when a person can't read, they feel terrible about themselves. There, there are kids, and I'm not kidding you, that in third and fourth grade have already left. They left school. Absolutely. They're done. Um, but the cool thing is the Kansas uh, Department of Education, through their ESSER funds, has provided... I think K through six, yeah, they're, they're paying for all the teachers that would want to do the letters program. And uh, I think when you're done with the letters program, you know a lot. You know what you should know. And uh, teachers. Yeah. teachers who have already been teaching who didn't know this, they do the letter program. It takes two years. I mean, it's, it's a quite a little effort. Uh, and then they have to work with a kid at the end to show they know how to do it, and then they're off and running. But yeah, I, I didn't mention that, but yeah, that's one of the things that a lot of teachers, they've, they're like, I feel terrible that all these kids I didn't know how to help, I'm helping them with ease at this point. Uh, and they're, they're becoming competent readers. And 
my definition of competent reading is a reading and their understanding what they're reading, not necessarily speed. You know, again, I'm a, I'm a slow reader because of the material I read, so I read everything slowly. You know, when you get to college, if you go to college, there's no professor that's like, well, it took you an hour to read that? I'm gonna dock you because everyone else did it in 20 minutes. Mm -mm. And we actually have at the college level, um, if, if they had a special education or on a 504 plan, they can get accommodations where accommodations are like a child who's learned how to read but is a slower reader, they can get like twice the amount of time to do a test. And, and you might think, well, that's just cheating, right? But we've, people have done studies on that. What we found that the kids who don't know Jack, you give them twice as much, they still don't know Jack, <laughs> you know? If you give someone who's a slow reader the time to read it because they're a slow reader, their scores go up because they know it and they just couldn't get to it. I have a friend in uh, Little Rock who um, is the dyslexia person in her school, and it's a high school, and these kids were getting C's and D's on all the tests. And she said to the instructors, they can come to my room, I'll give the test exactly the way you want to and every other way, I won't help them, nothing, but I'll give them time and a half and those grades went from C's and D's to A's and B's because they knew this stuff, they just didn't have the time to read it to get it out. Um, and you know, like on a, if people do the ACT and SATs now, um, you'll do better if you're given more time if you're a slow reader, you know, if, you're, if you have dyslexia or reading disabled. And I, I encourage parents to get a diagnosis because if you have a diagnosis, then you can get those accommodations if you're like, well, and he's done okay, or she's done okay. Uh, now that he's, she's a junior, we need for her to get accommodations. Like, what? Mm, I don't know about that, right? Because it is timed. But, so I also, I'm, I'm a proponent of, um, you know, different strategies like accommodations or assistive technology for kids who can't read well. We want them to learn how to read well, and while we're teaching them, they can have accommodations like audio readers or things like that, so they have the content of what they need to know and other stuff, but we also teach them to read at the same time so they don't get behind. Because once they get behind, right, it's tough. Earlier today, the one teacher really felt comfortable in reading, and they had five other teachers that were second, third grade teachers, six teachers. Uh, and one teacher really felt good about reading, so she was now hired just as a help, help the other teachers out to read. If one person was skilled in this school, could they? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's really cool about her entire school system, where K through six or whatever, getting letters training, if they leave, you're like, oh, we just, no, you just, they're probably going somewhere else in Kansas, right? Um, so, people, still gonna help. I think they're probably saying, we just started the letters, but you have to set aside money for it because you got paid for it. So you have to budget, I don't remember, I'll be honest, I don't know. I thought it was reasonable for the benefit that we'll get. Right, yeah, actually that's a really good point because the kids who come to our center, we ask them, you know, like things, lots of different things, but one of them is like, what's your favorite subject in school? Of course, they all hate reading. Um, but most of them in first and second grade say, I love math. But then in third grade and beyond, they never say math again because you have to read to get to the math problem. So we're even, yeah, it's like, like we, we got our funding from the legislator, legislature to do reading and STEM, and we're calling it, you know, uh, stream, because if you don't have the pivotal piece of reading, you can't do STEM. You can't. There's no way to do STEM without reading. So reading is an essential component of everything in our society today. You can't get around the fact that you you have to read. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't question anything about the science of reading. This is very refreshing. Um, I, when my kids come through and they were going to take me to stuff like that, I'd say, like, okay, <laughs> that's the way it's supposed to be. Or that's the way you're supposed to be talking now. Um, so my kids were involved with it about five years. I turned for a year and I was out of town. At the beginning of that, I watched all the staff, or at least part of the staff, three or four grade levels, work really, really hard. 
Yeah. I have a good, I actually have a response to that. Number one, this is the last chapter. You learn the science of reading, you don't need to know anything else. And, you, and the other stuff, we should be torching it all. I mean, we shouldn't be talking about balanced literacy. We shouldn't be talking about guided reading unless we're talking about the science of reading. We shouldn't be talking about whole language, whole word, any of that nonsense. Burn it. It's got to be burned. It's got to be torched. It's got to be eliminated. That's caused harm to our kids. Uh, so this is the last piece. You know, we get this piece right, we're done. Uh, we don't have to do anything else. Yeah. Right. They, like I said, after this, that's it. They don't. Yeah, there's a lot. A lot of it's money. You know, money drives a lot of it. Heinemann there's a publisher. They're in it for the money. Lucy Calkins knew for sure. I mean. She, there's no way you could be involved with reading, and for decades there's research saying this is how we should teach reading, and you're telling a different way to do it. I don't know, but the one thing I want to say lastly is what we need to do is we need to encourage people to go into to teaching. We're losing too many teachers today, and with, without teachers, our society is doomed. We are doomed. Who are teaching these kids how to read and do math and be kind to each other, like you know, how to interact with people even if you disagree with them without beating them to death, right? I mean, we have to get to a point where we can have conversations that we can learn from each other, even though we disagree. I tend to, to see the person's point of view and like, well, maybe that's a point I just hadn't thought of, right? But we need to get to that point. And right now, I mean, people dump on teachers all the time. Parents are dumping on teachers. Legislators across the country are dumping on teachers. We need to quit doing that because if we, if we keep dumping on teachers, if we think private school's the answer, believe me, it's not. It's not. I mean. There are awesome private schools, but people can't afford them. There's small places that they can't have private schools. Charter schools, the same thing. We need to invest in public school. We need to get it right. And when I talk about this stuff, I'm not blaming the teachers. I am absolutely not blaming the teachers. They can only teach what they know. And I know they have a hard, my whole family has been involved with teaching. I know what they do. There's no teacher I ever have seen that went home at 3 o'clock and ate bomb bomb by, by a swimming pool. You know, they're grading at night, they're developing stuff, they're very, very hard workers, and they do a, a very thankless job. Uh, and it's more thankless today than it ever has been. Uh, but we need to encourage people that, you know, the best and brightest, you can still be a teacher. Thank you.